So, uh, dear participants and all of you who are watching us and would be watching this video, this is Somava Basu. I'm the president and uh, founder of the Council for Global Cooperation, CGC. And I would like to warmly welcome you all to our today's session. This session would be a book discussion focusing on a recent book, When Democracy Died, The Middle East's Enduring Peace of Lausanne by Hans Lucas Kaiser, published in April 2023 by Cambridge University Press. The year 2023, as many of you might know, marks the centennial anniversary of the Treaty of Lausanne, and we are truly honored to host a discussion on Professor Kaiser's book that recounts the story of eight dramatic months of the Lausanne Conference. When Democracy Died comes out at a very significant year, for our viewers, I would like to give you a very brief note. Today's book discussion would come under the Lausanne Centenary Event Series of the CGC. As our viewers are aware that previously we had hosted a book discussion on Professor J. Winter's book, The Day the Great War Ended, 24 July 1923. Professor Kaiser's book is the second event to this series. In future, the CGC shall also host Professor Michel Toussaint's The Last Treaty, an event dedicated to the centenary anniversary of the Treaty of Lausanne shall also be followed after that, and also a virtual conference on Armenian genocide as part of this Lausanne centenary event series would be also happening very soon. For more information on this series and the upcoming events, please follow our website www.cgcinternational.co.in and other CGC social media channels. For now, let me introduce our today's featured speaker and the book author, Professor Hans Lucas Kaiser. Professor Hans Lucas Kaiser is an associate professor of modern history at the University of Newcastle, Australia, and a titular professor at the University of Zurich, Switzerland. As a historian, Professor Kaiser's research focuses on the World War I history, late Ottoman Empire and Turkey, history of violence and genocide studies. He was an invited professor at Stanford University, University of Michigan, Belgium University in Istanbul, and many others. He was the president of the Research Foundation Switzerland Turkey in Basel from 2006 to 2016 and is part of several academic institutions and think tanks. He is an author of numerous publications in different languages. I would like to highlight three of them. Talat Pasha, Father of Modern Turkey, Architect of Genocide, ne Nearest East, American Millennialism, and Mission to the Middle East, and A Quest for Belonging, Anatolia Beyond Empire and Nation, 19th to 21st centuries. He received the 2016 Presidential Award by the Armenian President and 2017 Bogusian Prize for his significant contributions in the research of the Armenian Genocide. It's a great privilege to have you today with us, Professor Kaiser. And along with our discussant, Professor Donald Bloxon, whom I would introduce a little later in the session today. I would also warmly like to welcome our uh, association member, eminent historian, Professor Jay Winter, to be part of this session as a guest participant. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Winter, for your time today. Uh, now, without further delays, I would like to pass on the floor to Professor Kaiser for his opening remarks and for the brief overview of your book. Professor Kaiser, the Zoom floor is yours. Over to you. Yeah, hello all, and uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the opportunity to talk uh, here about when democracy democracy died this new book and uh, to discuss also together then the the landmark landmark event that was the conference of Lausanne so a few basics uh, first perhaps I will then also use a powerpoint very shortly also this uh, Lausanne Treaty definitively liquidated the, the Ottoman Empire in legal terms. It's important to know that things were open until then for many people at least who believed uh, uh, that uh, things could be changed still. And this treaty recognized and defined post-Ottoman Turkey, uh, not only by what is written in the treaty, by, but by the whole situation, by the Lausanne moment, as one can also call it. 
It re-established the Western interactions with Turkey that was now centered in Ankara, the new capital of a republic that was soon to be proclaimed based on this treaty. And the Lausanne moment is key to understand the construction of Republican Turkey as well as the uh, problems of Turkey. I may now use sharing screen. Let's let's see if that works. Yes, it seems to work, isn't it? Do you see the shared screen? Yes, yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So the Lausanne Treaty nowadays has never been so bluntly challenged on a high level than by the government or the circles who are now in power in Ankara. Their attitude toward Lausanne is resentful and revanchist because of the loss then of the imperial Sultanate Caliphate and of territories they still believe belong in reality to Turkey. We may call this uh, an Islamist Turkey's neo-Ottoman revisionism, which results from this attitude and which contrasts with the triumphalist modernist narrative of Lausanne by the Kemalists in the aftermath of 1923. Uh, yeah, let's, let me a little bit continue with, uh, with what is uh, topical today. Many Middle Easterners wrongly believe that the Lausanne Treaty becomes void in July. And I, 1920, uh, to, 2023, that is uh, in a few weeks, and that the new era will start. Conspiracy theories and ideas of secret stipulations have been abounding since nearly 100 years, notably about the Caliphate. The current revisionism stands in uh, an even starker contrast with the critique of the treaty by experts of international law and human rights and with the complaints by representatives of autochthone uh, non-Turkish Anatolian peoples then and now who, like the Armenians, definitively lost 100 years ago their millenarian home or like the Kurds, lost any perspective of a plural, not unitary, unshared Anatolia. The military victory of Turkish nationalist forces forced the revision of the Middle East, or as it was called, the Near East Peace Treaty signed in Paris Sèvres in 1920. This revision took place in Lausanne, as we all know. So Lausanne is the last treaty of a series of uh, treaties. At the same time, it changes uh, the, whole, uh, the whole picture. I will explain this. It should be noted that the majority of uh, Ankara's leaders, as well as those in Ankara's delegation uh, to Lausanne in 1922-23, had belonged to the Young Turk dictatorship of the 1910s. The participation at Lausanne was an incisive experience that formed and informed the core elite of the burgeoning republic, in particular uh, Ankara's diplomats. So it was also called a school of diplomacy. Uh, the original caption for this photo that is in the Library of Congress tellingly reads, I quote, this is the delegation of Turks which was sent to Lausanne. It is a fair type of the men who are governing Turkey today. Uh, uh, Professor Kaiser, sorry to interrupt. Uh, your screen is not visible actually now. It's not visible, but okay. but. It, it normally should share. Also here I, I read, you are screen sharing. So what's the problem now? There is no picture on the screen, that's the thing. There is no picture. So I, I will try again. Yes, it, it is coming now. It works. Okay, so you, you didn't not see the first one. Uh, 
that was had been the first one but let's go to the sec to to this one so the the delegation it's only a part of the dele delegation there were about 40 people so those who were present at the end of the conference in lausanne <clears throat> ankara was seeking recognition for its nationalist project in the whole of asia minor the formerly polyethnic, multi-religious geography of Asia Minor was to be subjected to the sole sovereignty of Turkish Muslim nationalism, which definitively excluded other peoples and other projects, including other Turkish, more democratic, let's say, projects. Only victors had access to the negotiation table, be it the victors of World War I, be it the victors of the wars in Anatolia after wars. And the, the list of the excluded who were present within official delegation is quite long. You can read it on the slide. To my understanding, a new and critical scholarly interest in the Lausanne Conference and Treaty grew three decades ago, especially during the ex-Yugoslavia wars, by revisiting the so-called Greek-Turkish population exchange. Until then, this uh, Lausanne recipe had been considered a hard and brutal but successful means of conflict resolution. So the so-called population exchange was one part of a much bigger treaty, even if it, it was not in the treaty itself, but in a convention that, but that was part at the end of the treaty, made part. The exchange involved the compulsory transfer of nearly 2 million people, the majority uh, of them Anatolian Christians, to Greece, as specified in that convention that I mentioned, and which was signed six months before the treaty. Important progresses in historical sciences regarding the end of the Ottoman Empire, the Young Turk Party states, its genocide and the continuities in Bolshevik supported Ankara, etc., etc., were drivers for scholars to come back to the Lausanne Tree, the, which is rightly called uh, Republican Turkey's birth certificate. Meanwhile, I would say, but we can. can discuss this, uh, the scholarly comeback to the Lausanne moment amounts to a comprehensive, much less Eurocentric rethinking of the post-World War I order. My book explores the main topics, players, interactions, negotiations, and the language used at the conference. So you see here the table of contents. Uh, the central and by far largest part three deals with the conference itself, logically. After explaining the context and prehistory, especially the immediate prehistory, but which is a whole decade uh, in the parts before. Parts three and four taken together clarify a synchronous deal-making in Lausanne uh, and the establishment of dictatorship in Ankara. One depended on the other. And from mid-1920s, the Kemalist dictatorship was fully established. And especially once Britain had got Mosul, it was fully and uh, established and accepted and, and in no ways uh, questioned, even not by the uh, Americans who were observers uh, in Lausanne, who refused to, uh, to ratify their uh, small Lausanne Treaty, as it is called, the separate Lausanne Treaty, but uh, which uh, was analogous. But they did finally follow in the lines of the Europeans uh, on the basis of, uh, of bilateral uh, agreements. <clears throat> I interpret the Treaty of Lausanne as an agreement between the aging national empires of Western Europe, notably the UK and France, mandatory powers in the former Ottoman provinces on the one hand, and the new government in Ankara on the other. Ankara, the winner of the wars in Anatolia, the others, as I said, the great war victors. 
Significantly, the Treaty of Lausanne was no longer headed by the Covenant of the League of Nations, which stood at the beginning of all the other treaties signed in Paris. So here is an important departure in this last treaty. Because of the eminent role initially played by the League of Nations, my book uses the term Paris-Geneva peace for the initial Western peace architecture after 1918, which definitively broke down in Lausanne, in my view. So the political project was dead or was definitively killed in Lausanne. This doesn't, did not mean that the League of Nations with its institutions, with its uh, all kind of activities still was an important institution, but not as an independent political project. So the treaty, the Lausanne Treaty is therefore above all a pact of interests between powers seeking to reassure themselves of their future and their interests. We should not forget that the, the European national empires, also the victors of World War I, were, were partly in ruins because of all what they had made through, through the, in the decade before. And it was a pact of interest with no political project beyond that, beyond this assurance of interests. And for and among uh, the peoples concerned, and there was certainly not a democratic uh, project in this treaty. So in my eyes, this is why the Lausanne Treaty heralded an anti-democratic future for the Middle East. I do not say there was democracy, so I should perhaps detail and say uh, when the hope on democracy died uh, in the title, but titles always are short. It is important to note that Italian fascism and what I call Turkish proto-fascism and assertive ultranationalism have both performed their international coming out in Lausanne, where all in all they were embraced by Western diplomats and industrialists. Many Turkish, uh, many contemporary cartoons, Turkish uh, and, and, and Europeans uh, catch well the new nature of interaction. So uh, the fascist uh, and uh, uh, the assertive in, in the sense of, of, of brachial, brachial power, <laughs> the, yeah, direct power, brute power. <clears throat> and uh, Many Turkish cartoons mirror the confidence in military solutions based on the victories during the Anatolian Wars after 1918. As you see here, I have translated the, the, the Ottoman uh, uh, cap captions in, um, in, in English. And so the things must be, be solved by force. That's still. Uh, quite a current uh, conviction among not only some uh, cartoon uh, uh, artists, but also uh, among a majority of the delegates, especially around the circle around uh, Rosanur. Rosanur, uh, you have seen it on him on the first. This is Rosanur. This is Inanu, the chief of the delegation, the vice chief, but the vice chief is the senior diplomat who all, already negotiated the Lausanne, uh, the, the, pardon, the Moscow Treaty 1921. So, so he was important and influent. <clears throat> and <clears throat> yeah, here you see Mussolini's arrival shortly after the march to Rome, so after he had become the prime minister and at the same time also the foreign minister of Italy. Uh, so very assertive, there are many photographs of, of, of him. He was a media star in Lausanne. And you see also a scheme with which I try to explain the new kind of interwar realpolitik and international, pardon, I, yeah, international uh, 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 interaction that dev devaluates the, 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 the League of Nations, at least an independent League of Nations. It's, it's more a League of Nations now in the service of the powers. 
The conference in se itself was a conference in two parts. So I described this really in detail. And uh, the first act, uh, so to say, was the main plot of this first act was uh, the interaction between London and Ankara. So they had to come to terms and essentially they came to terms and uh, Britain got its essentials that is an open future, meaning an Iraqi or, or mandatory future for Mosul, open straits and a certain separation of Bolshevik Moscow from, from, uh, from uh, Ankara and also of Ankara from pan-Islamism. So both were, uh, were spectres for, for, for Britain. The second act is then more uh, where uh, Athens, Paris and Rome are involved with primary interests uh, of also financial and economic interests, also interests, especially of repayment of the Ottoman debts or also reparations. So, so it was a, a, again a, a, a difficult uh, time, but as far as fundamental issues and human rights issues were concerned, even if they still played a role also with regard to the Armenians and the question of restitution and return, etc., the main negotiations on this had already taken place in the first weeks. And we can say that the Turkish side got what it wanted by early January 1923, especially regarding the Armenians at the total rejection of an Armenian home. So the two powers were winners, if we want. Ankara, of course, at least in Kemalist view. Britain also a little bit... Uh, more uh, discreetly, I would say Britain lost its soul as far as the empire had had a certain uh, claim on, on, on an imperial on imperial ethics that was definitely lost in Lausanne. I follow Michel Duzan on this point. And uh, the others, uh, France was not a winner, even if it believed to be a winner because uh, of, of its early flirt with the Kemalists already in 1920-21. So it's this repayment of the debts. I, 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 I also uh, took an analysis by, by a thesis at Geneva University was not made, largely not made. So even if they promised, pro promised to do so, so in contrast to the Bolsheviks who rejected all their uh, debts they, they, they wanted, uh, they at least promised to do so, uh, but they largely didn't pay, repay, and everything was just uh, glossed over because one needs Turkey, so that's Lausanne speech is appeasing speech also, and uh, not delving into uh, uh, demands that one had had. That's also true for the minority uh, issues, where uh, even if already the minority uh, claims uh, and the minority rights had been strongly limited in Lausanne, even what had been promised in the treaty, so important rights nevertheless, they uh, could in fact not be uh, implemented, and especially they were not uh, followed up by the signatory powers. Uh, promise, pardon, now I, uh, I made, a, I must go back here. Yeah, here. Yeah, so, so we, we talked on this, and then the treaty itself uh, uh, is, yeah, has, is divided in, in different parts. Uh, and especially uh, the territorial and also uh, the, the fundamental rights part concerning minorities uh, are in this first part, uh, but not to forget the convention, so exchange of corporations. Uh, I will not delve into this, so it's not a, a legal law book that I presented, but I tried then to analyze and, and, and to, to put in short, uh, words uh, what I regard uh, uh, the Lausanne 
dip Lausanne's diplomatic success, I use here the, the, the Turkish word because the Turkish word really means the Lausanne moment, the treaty, the conference. So it, it has a little bit uh, a fuller feeling than the, the, the uh, a European one. And that's, uh, I, I explained it, in fact, it is the acceptance on the one hand of, of the European mandates and to leaving them uh, quietly and not further disturb them on the one hand, and on the other hand, to fully recognize the Turkish sovereignty uh, on uh, Anatolia. It, there is this appeasement uh, uh, part also, which of course uh, always uh, uh, relies uh, or refers to promises made by Ankara in Lausanne, even if they were not filled, uh, filled in, and even uh, if, uh, if they were uh, not very credible. And the diplomats knew this, but they uh, took it as such uh, because everybody wanted to come to the deal. <laughs> that, that was so simple like this. And the silencing of the Armenian Kurdish Syria Arab question is, is this sad and dark side. It includes the silence on genocides which are without any responsibility, without any uh, 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 work on, 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 on the past and, and crimes against humanity. And without, uh, and by abandoning all democratic uh, uh, claim, uh, uh, and that's therefore, and that's probably the core of my book, the core challenge, and that's why it is in the title, uh, the democratic social contracts in my eyes are the the core of the problem, the core of the challenge still, and uh, that's uh, where uh, Lausanne, even if it was a success in diplom diplomatic terms, it was a deep failure in terms of uh, democracy. Yeah. Uh, so peacemaking in Lausanne was about leaving behind and making forget the decade before, not to reckon with it. Also, historical argumentations abounded during conference discussion. The elephant in the room were the Armenians and any historical clarification related to their fate. The claim of at least an Armenian province under Ankara's rule for homeless returnees and genocide survivors that was a far crime from the independent Armenia projected in Sevra, was fiercely rejected in Lausanne, as I said, in early January. And the first list on a list of, uh, first point of a, in a list of 14 instructions given to Ankara's delegation, insisted on the imperative to interrupt the negotiations if the Armenian topic was put on the table. And when it was put on the table, then Rzanur, you see him here, the uh, the, the, the chief in the subcommission for minorities uh, left furiously the meeting room with his team in consent of, uh, with Ismet and in full accordance with the instructions. And Noor's team, by the way, included Sukru Saracholu, the later interior minister, the former uh, close collaborator of Talat Pasha, the, the man responsible for the concentration camps in Northern Syria, and also Munir Ertegün, uh, a lawyer who had been with Talat Pasha at the Brest-Litovsk negotiations and later became the ambassador in the USA and was successful in, uh, in uh, preventing a Hollywood uh, film on the 40 Tage des Musada, the 40 uh, uh, days of Musada. As I said, the, the Lausanne language of promises uh, and civilization, Ankara's uh, promises on civilization, secularism and democracy, so they used the word democracy, decisively facilitated a deal that everyone wanted. All involved governments were eager to strike it after a decade of devastating wars and crises. So all the whole negotiation process was intertwined with new narratives uh, on history and a civilizationist vocabulary. 
religion was almost felt almost felt as an embarrassment by Ankara's delegates. Also, from 1911 to 1922, the Turkish wars all had explicitly been fought in the name of Islam and as jihad. Race, in contrast to religion, was felt as part of a more or less accepted vocabulary in Lausanne. And this situation, so this Lausanne moment, contributed to strengthening the racial pillar in Ankara's framing of national belonging and of moder modernity at the cost of the religious pillar, which during the 1910s still had crucially determined Turkish nationalism a la Zia Gökal. So Zia Gökal is the mentor of the Unionist regime under Talak Pasha and the mastermind also until now recognized as such of uh, Turkish nationalism. He had insisted during the 1910s on Islam being the most modern and progressive monotheism. And that had been a pillar of his uh, version, first version, let's say, of Turkish nationalism. So the vocabulary of Kemalist modernity and history was for the first time clearly articulated within the force field of Lausanne. And it influenced the new Western visions of the post-Ottoman era and area during the remainder of the 20th century, in particular Anatolians, Anatolia's modern history was by and large looked at through Kemalist lenses by Western academia and diplomacy. In this vision, Ghazi Kemal, the later Atatürk, looked benign and unique among totalitarian interwar autocrats. He led a model dictatorship committed to peace with the world and to the best development of its, of its country and his country, that is secular Western-oriented civilization. It represented, as it were, the model of a developmental or educational dictatorship. Elements of the future Kemalist history doctrine and of the Turkish history thesis popped up in the context or even in the minute of the Lausanne Conference. The most important among them is the concept of a quasi autochthonous or at least multi-millennial presence of Furanians or Proto-Turks in Anatolia and in the entire Middle East that preceded the Armenians, the Greeks, the Assyrians, the Persians and all others. Not only Rezanur, but many others also, Ghazi Kemal, as Atatürk, during his promotional tour through Anatolia in early 1923, spread this idea. Uh, the Ankara, the Lausanne anchored discourse, if I may say that, of contemporary Turkey and her history overlooked the cohesiveness of Turkey's foundation starting already in 1913, because the Ankara's delegation uh, struggled hard to make forget and not to put uh, on the table any discussion on this decade before, except the years of the wars with Greece. That yes, that they emphasized, they overemphasized. Uh, it this therefore whitewashed the dark sides of World War I, turned a blind, blind eye to the omnipresent Turanianism in the minds of many nationalists. I would say a majority of the nationalists and a majority of those in Lausanne. And uh, you have already seen the slide that I put uh, here uh, of my. Uh, the PowerPoint, a well-known example is the claim on 23rd of January 1923 by Ismet Inönü, the chief of the delegations, that the Kurds are racially Turanians, that is Turkish, so that Mosul must belong to Turkey. The issue of Turanianism and the Turanian master narrative is most manif manifest with Rezanur, uh, whom I already shortly presented. The same day, 23rd of January, Ismet also added the argument that now no longer any right of conquest existed, and that therefore, for every true modern democrat in the world, Mosul belonged to Turkey. He also insisted that full-fledged exemplary democracy existed in Ankara, where Kurds sat in the National Assembly. Any trouble of the government with Kurds in recent history was due to incitement by certain consuls. And Rezanur claimed that Turkey had established an entirely democratic regime. 
that was a quotation, since the separation of the Caliphate from the state and the abolition of the monarchy on 1st November. An al a hypothetical alternative to the turn to race and culturalism would, of course, have been a polity according to a modern democratic social contract. The British potentially Rambold, so Curson was the one in the first round, first act, then Rambold was the chief of the British delegation in the second. He said at the end of the very last negotiation meeting on 17th of July 1923, in a typical Western Lausanne language, as I want to call it, that oscillated between pious wish, euphemism, and entreaty. I quote, the whole world will be happy to see a strong and pro prosperous Turkey with a government supported by its inhabitants, regardless of race or religion. After one had, one had swallowed all the reduction of minority rights and, and, and accepted that uh, Armenians would not be allowed to return, except some individual cases. I believe Rambold insisted that, he, I quote, Switzerland can serve as a model for the Turkish state. So, pious wish. Here we see a country composed of three distinct, distinct lineages or races speaking four different languages and believing in two different religions. So diverse, they form a solid political body. End of quotation. We certainly find political thought in this way among constitutionally constitutionally minded people in the context of Ottoman Turkey, especially in 1908, but no longer afterwards among those at least close to power, to CUP power, Young Turk power. Gökhalp, I mentioned him, the mentor of nationalism, rejected this way explicitly when in the early 1910s already he and his peers vigorously, vigorously embraced Muslim Turkishness as the essential core of the new Turkey, which they started to evoke since the early 1910s. Still, because of its universally positive appreciation, appreciation the word democracy was several times evoked, as I said, and claimed at Lausanne, also by the Turkish uh, Heads of, heads of delegation, and after Lausanne, not before, before uh, uh, Atatürk said, no, no, we are not a democracy, but, uh, but after Lausanne, he understood that one must use this word a little bit carefully. He claimed also democracy. Yeah, uh, I, I'm short now. I think I have I've taken my time, isn't it? I, I will take two minutes, perhaps, and, and end. Uh, I come... <clears throat> Uh, just a little bit an outlook. Uh, in his book, Atatürk ich die Lale, also the, the revolution by Atatürk, that was written in the 1930s, Mahmoud Esad Boskurt, this was the justice minister who implemented the Lausanne-inspired law revolution. He states the follow following, when Atatürk reigns, the nation reigns, and there is perfect modern authoritarian democracy with the sub supreme chief taking his authority Pardon, authority from his nation. Nation, revolution, and leader thus form an organic whole in Boscourt's notion of democracy, what of course has very little to do with a democracy that implements human rights individually and collectively. And uh, the closest terminological connection of this kind of democracy that democracy that comes to my mind is that with Carl Schmitt, the later star lawyer of the Nazis. There were no German delegates in Lausanne, but the conference received strong coverage in the German press. Nationalist uh, papers expressed admiration for Ankara's successes. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the German historian uh, German Israeli historian Stefan Erich, that you, most of you know, uh, has shown in his uh, recent research that the early Nazis took Ankara much more as a role model than only nascent fascist Rome or as or the Greenhorn that Mussolini then was. Hans Tröbst, for example, was a German soldier who also fought with the forces of Ankara and who was then also close to the Nazis and to Hitler. And in his words, the Kemalists had arrived 
I quote, to set in Lausanne the keystone on the proud building of an ethnically purified and renewed Turkey. And now the Germans, he continued, troops continued, waited with consuming ardor for a savior of the same batch. So this was the paragon. The others were paragons of the second rank. We do not need to look at German connections. The dark side of Lausanne is most clearly present in the mental universe of Rosanur and his manuscript Ermeni Tarichi that he finalized during the Lausanne conference. This is a harrowing document of social Darwinist thinking and of exterminatory contempt and hate against Armenian and Jews. In my reading, it fabricates a Turanian master narrative of history that establishes the Turks as the Herrenrasse, the race of the lords, in the past, the present, and the future. In North's case, is what, it was not about fantasies of a powerless eccentric. Uh, he was then really in, at his height. He, he had been a minister several times, uh, several posts in, in Ankara already, a co-founder of the Ankara government, and negotiated the Moscow Treaty, and Lausanne was uh, the culmination. Uh, so this man... Uh, this man wrote this manuscript of which you see on this slide uh, sentences that uh, are uh, of the most extreme one, one, one knows uh, from the racists and, and from genocidal minds, uh, if you want to put it like this, in that period. Uh, I end saying that there was a small group also of comparatively liberal patriots in the delegation by the end of January 1923. However, they were definitively sidelined, side and Rizanur was instrumental in sidelining these uh, more moderate uh, people like J Javid Bey, like Hamid Bey, like Dr. N Nihat Rejad Belger, who was later the personal doctor of, uh, of Atatürk. So he was called back. He went, most of them went to exile. Javid not, he was executed by, in a judicial murder uh, in Ankara three years later with the accusation that he had plotted against the Kemalists during the Lausanne conference in April, 1923. Yeah, that's, uh, I think uh, enough. Uh, and sorry for ending with the dark aspects of the Lausanne conference. I stop sharing. Yeah, sure. So uh, great. Thank you, Professor Geyser, for this great overview and for highlighting the key themes from your stimulating, wonderful research. I would like to mention to our participants that you can post your questions in the chat box and hope you participate in the discussion. We would read your uh, questions during the discussion period and would try to cover as much as possible. So for, but for now, I would like to go to our panelist, Professor David uh, Donald Bloxham. Let me start by introducing him. Professor Donald Bloxham is a Richard Paris Professor of European History, Modern History and Historiography at the University of Edinburgh. He specializes in genocide, war crimes and other mass atrocity studies. He's the editor of the Journal of Holocaust Education and co-editor of the Oxford University Press monograph series, Zones of Violence. He has been awarded 2006 Philip Leverhulme Prize, 2007 Edinburgh University Chancellor's Award, and 2007 Raphael Lemkin Award by the International Association of Genocide Scholars. From 2007 to 2008, he was J.B. Mo JB and Morris C. Shapiro's Senior Scholar in Residence at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Some of his notable publications include History and Morality, Why History a History, The Final Solution, A Genocide Among Others, and many more. It's great to have you, Professor uh, Donald Dawson, and the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you for that very kind introduction and, and thank you for the invitation to be here. It's, it's, it's really 
uh, an honour to be asked and um, you know to speak to a, a, an audience largely unfamiliar names and it's really great and I, I really admire the work you're doing um, Samara um, with this new sort of project and centre you have and it's also a real pleasure to be asked to speak uh, about the work of my old friend of mine Hans Lucas who is um, if I can talk on a personal note for a second was very uh, encouraging to me early on in my first attempts my first rather cack handed attempts to to deal with them um, uh, the prehistory and history of the Armenian genocide and he was incredibly useful um, in those early days in shaping my ideas and I think um, if I were to set this present excellent work of his in a bit of his own historiographical context I don't quite know where one would start but probably with the work that came out in the year 2000 itself um, his book on uh, title translates as the squandered peace um, mission uh, missionaries ethnicity and uh, and state in the, the, in the late ottoman empire wasn't it? from the, about 1839 up to 19 to the 1920s um, and this is it was a real eye opener this book for me because up to that point most of my understanding of missionaries had been a rather stereotyped sort of agents of imperialism kind of understanding and I think it's very important in showing a different side to the missionary endeavor and um, you know an endeavor that was ultimately I suppose destroyed or significantly destroyed alongside the Christian minorities in around the first world war period but had some very interesting sort of roots and ideas involved in it and I, I think that it also had a quality which is endured in Hans Lucas's writing throughout really this major oeuvre on late Ottoman um, and, and near stroke Middle Eastern history which he provided and, I mean not just talking about works that he single authored but this incredible body of edited material a really high quality of a series of really significant edited volumes bringing the latest and best most sophisticated scholarship on the late Ottoman Empire to, to, to a broad attention. Well, that editing project is really very, very significant. Um, throughout that, and incorporated in this present book, um, is what I would call a, a very acute moral sensibility. Um, I remember talking at some conference, probably about 20 years ago, to Hans Lucas about the, the Swiss, Swiss missionary uh, Jakob Kunzler and his, his diaries and his, and his own sort of reflection upon late Ottoman history and had this kind of very interesting, acute observation, but also sort of very strong moral sense. Oh, something which comes through, is often beaten out of professional historians as part of their, as part of their vocational training. Uh, as they enter the realm of pure analysis. But what Hans Luca has, has shown, I think, superbly, really, over a lifetime's work is it's perfectly possible to have the excellent analysis and the very, very strong overt moral, moral sensibility um, in his writing. And this also it goes for not just um, the treatment of big terrible events and, and victims but also for perpetrators and I think here we're talking about obviously uh, Luzernur has a major role to play this guy who's as Hans Lucas mentioned is the effectively the chief nego negotiator really at, at Lausanne despite being second in command notionally to Ismet Inunu um, he's he really in charge of the day-to-day -day stuff and your uh, Hans Lucas's sort of analysis of his not just his role there but also his, his his own historical sensibility and his manipulation of the historical record brings me in mind of, of the treatment of another trained doctor about Han, whom Hans Lucas has written and some of you may may know Hans Lucas's really stat, benchmark biography published mon monograph on the biography of Talat Pasha, the archi major architect of the Armenian genocide, but he also wrote a fascinating and very disturbing essay on the, the development and the life and crimes, as it were, of the, 
former governor of Diyarbakir province in um, the Ottoman Empire in the, in the First World War, uh, Mehmed uh, Reshi Chahingre, another doctor, another, another trained um, physician who, who applied his thought to sociology and came up with social Darwinism as a sort of answer. Um, and this sort of applied medico, socio-medical thought was clearly a major element in the way he set about murdering most of the Christians of his city and province um, in 1915. But it was the treatment, I think, of, I remember Hans Lucas writing about not just the appalling nature of what this man had done, but also something about the tragic nature of this man who's, who'd set himself the goal of, like so many of these of the young Turks, set himself the goal of some sort of national recovery. Mm -hmm. Another of these persons whose biography might have ended up in a different direction had he embraced alternative futures, alternative modernities. There's something about the way in which our author managed to bring out this sense of possibility as well as the sense of horror with no sense of mitigation of what he'd done no sense of moral mitigation, I'm just saying, a reflection on possible alternatives. And, and in a way, this book with its title, what, where, <laughs> When Democracy Died, is, all, is, 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 is partly hinting at a major alternative. Isn't it? It's talking about when something, it's what, what didn't happen, what could have happened possibly, what alternative futures were available but were not taken. And I think the first question, I suppose, for, for Hans Lucas that I'd like to ask pertains to this, pertains to the, the D word here, Obviously, it's in the title, and you also also mentioned in your talk just now that you'd um, you qualified it a little and sort of talking about when the promise of democracy died, perhaps rather than democracy itself. And it's a word that comes up a great deal during the during the book. And at some points, you give you give a real sort of tight tight kind of institutional definition of it. At other points, it seems to stand as basically a cipher for for something good. Something, something better than what, what turned out. Sometimes it seems to be a synonym for liberal. Sometimes it seems to be a synonym for plural or pluralist. Um, at some point, it, yeah, it has, a, has a more kind of, a kind of rhetorical valence than, than kind of precise, let's call it social scientific usage. I don't regard that as a problem, by the way, I, at all. But I am interested in, in, the, in, in the choice of that as a kind of guiding um, motif for the, for the book. You know, when, when one thinks of, of Lausanne, one thinks of many things, and you've brought them all out <laughs> amazingly in this book. Um, as I said prior to coming on air, I, we, when I was first asked to do this talk, I rather had and saw the title of this book before I'd read it. I, I thought this might be rather dry, <laughs> diplomatic history, and, and uh, it's not that. Well, it's 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 got the necessary diplomatic material in it, excellently done as well. But it's a much broader, moral, cultural. Um, international, or I don't know, et cetera, et cetera, a whole bunch of different perspectives drawn on this, drawn, brought to bear on this really fundamental moment, bringing out so many, so many aspects of Lausanne that I hadn't thought about. But of course, in my own work, I've come across and, and reflected on Lausanne a reasonable amount myself, and and thinking about it historically. If I'm thinking about what what does Lausanne mark the end of? Some of the kind of the concepts that spring to mind are things like ethno-religious pluralism, you know, the end of the Ottoman Empire, um, the end of a kind of that interesting experiment in up to and excluding its extraordinarily violent final decades, that, that, that interesting experiment in hierarchical but nonetheless sort of coexistent humanity across particular ethno-religious groups. And I suppose, commonly speaking, one thinks of Lausanne as marking an end of that. Um, pluralism, certain liberal possibilities, again, that one mentioned. Democracy isn't necessarily one of the first things that would have sprung to mind. And, and that's, I, I suppose, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but the one reason I'd like, like to, you to maybe spend, spend a bit more time reflecting on what democracy does, in you know, what, what you think of democracy really does as a kind of alternative conception here as a sort of antithetical conception here in this book what work it's really and why why you chose that really i'd really like to hear more about that because and that and it runs into my second question um 
because when we're thinking of democracy at that point in, in time, in the interwar period, thinking about the different peace dispensations, the different territorial dispensations um, between, uh, let's say, Versailles and, uh, and Lausanne, concepts of self-determination and self-governance are in the air. Notoriously tricky to pin down exactly what these mean. You know, and some people seem to have to, to automatically associate them with democracy. Some people seem to think, well, actually, as, as long as a people can be said to be self-determining, it could, it could actually be a dictatorship, as long as it's a dictatorship of, of a kind of populist sort. Uh, and, 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 and it's one of those not entirely empty signifiers, self-determination um, self and self self-governance, but they are somewhat underspecified, you know, whatever Wilson might have had in mind himself when it comes to the practice of the early interwar period, self-determination and self-government. You know, they have this thing, they have this feel of democracy, but it doesn't necessarily mean how they catch, cash out, not just in Turkey, but anywhere else. And it, and it also doesn't necessarily mean that that's how they were supposed to cash out, <laughs> according to the people preaching and, 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 and grabbing onto them. So there's something I'd like you to think about, what, I suppose it's really moving from democracy to moving to those thinking of those peace treaties more broadly. You mentioned that you and, and Michelle, Derb, Professor Tuzan, you know, talking about this concept of Lausanne being when British imperial imperialism lost its um, soul. I mean, I this is a matter for some debate. You see, I think it, <laughs> I, I think it didn't have one to, to lose, but. Um, you know, by this point, it's, well, if ever, I mean, I think, it, it, you know, it so much depends where you're looking and when you're looking. I, I'm not at all surprised by Lausanne, having, having looked at the history of British foreign policy. Uh, and I'm not surprised by the inst ultimately instrumental attitude towards the death of very large numbers of innocent people. Um, this also being a polity that had been party to the genocide of the Tasmanians, the Opium Wars, uh, the, the, the unnecessary deaths of millions of people in the 1870s and the 1890s during the Great Indian Famines. This, I find, I think this, it does make me think of Sefra in this connection. Um, because so much of your counterpoint here, Lausanne and, and alternatives, um, several will be one of the counterpoints of something. It's not a, something that you spend a huge amount of time on in the book, I think. I, I mean, I've, I think I've read it all in the fashion of you know, reading different chapters in different orders that one can never be sure. But Severo doesn't spend, doesn't have a huge amount of time detail to, uh, devoted to it in the book. Um, obviously, Severo is a very different sort of territorial arrangement to Lausanne. I didn't think it necessarily emerged in British thinking from an infinitely more humanitarian perspective, uh, I, um, even though it might have had, you know, we obviously had very different consequences uh, and very different consequences for the, the former subject peoples of the Ottoman Empire. Um, I, I think, I suppose, so what, am I, what am I thinking about to ask about Sefra? Okay, I'll try, and, I'll try and get this in a nutshell. This will be my second and final question, it depends on this. Uh, so the first one is about, you know, what role democracy plays. And the second one, I'm just going to turn to page two of your of this book. Um, and I really, you know, to those of you putting up with listening to me, I can't recommend this book enough. It's really a magnificent piece of, of scholarship. On page two, you talk about um, the punitive PC. Uh, this is just a quote. Um, the punitive treaties of Paris, Versailles and Paris Trianon. As well as, as well as related settlements that frustrated World War victors like Italy and Japan, undeniably contributed to the rise of resentful fascisms in Europe and Asia. Also, it is well known that when the Chinese felt to be, that what the Chinese felt to be the betrayal of a deprived ally by the Paris Peace Conference radicalized Chinese nationalism and boosted the rise of communism. Now that's certainly true. Then you move on to Lausanne which rewarded revisionist violence. And that's the key part here and as, as the inspiration for, 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 for Hitler and so on, is the rewarding of, of, of revisionist violence, cancelling the, the, the Paris Sèvres Treaty. So in a sense there, we've got two different sets of treaties. We've got one kind of the Versailles Treaty, which encourages revisionism by its territorial terms and other terms. 
And then we've got a, a, a treaty that rewards revisionism. Um, and in a sense, these are all bases covered. <laughs> you got the one, the one sort of treaty which went in one direction and can be blamed for a bunch of stuff. And then another treaty which goes in the other direction and can be blamed for another bunch of stuff. Um, Severa is kind of hanging there again as the sort of precursor. And obviously it itself would have been seen, seen by the inheritors of the late Ottoman elite as being itself a rather punitive treaty, Severa. No, I, I'm not, I, 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 so, um, I want to, I think, ask you maybe to talk a bit more about, if, if rightly you're saying that in the first of those paragraphs that some of the settlements of the, the First World War in Europe and the way they ignored certain other parties set, set the scene for reactions to those treaties. The same, of course, could be said of Severa. Um, and 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 but it perhaps you you don't seem to do that explicitly or as much in the book itself you see and I, and I wondered what you know it's a sort of provocation right of sort of sorts and I wondered in just in terms of thinking about alternative possibilities and democratization what would the best Sevra have been that would have maximized the opportunities for so this is pure counter, counterfactuality. What would the best Severa have been that, ha, that would have minimized the chances of a kind of reaction from the nationalists in Anatolia and might have maximized the possibility for a, a, a more coexistent future, and possibly even a more democratic one? Thank you so much, Professor Bloxham, for this excellent commentary on, on uh, when democracy died. Uh, it was fabulous to hear you. And so, yeah, you, are, you have raised a few questions for Professor Kaiser. And so, Professor Kaiser, would you like to respond to that? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Donald, for this uh, uh, so uh, intelligent reading of, of the book and, and, and bringing together so many and also the important aspects. Uh, let me start with the last point. Uh, also, of course, uh, as the, the, the fact that Severa is a punitive treaty is absolutely uh, clear. Uh, I, so I'm a little bit disturbed that this is perhaps not explicit enough, but it is meant also on this page two of, of the book, it is meant. What, what I add then is to say that one has not thought enough about Sèvres, Lausanne, and the direct, so the, the, the emphasis is on direct implications, the direct implications of the nascent uh, radical uh, German nationalism in particular. So that is, let's say, the emphasis in, in this passage. What would have been a better Sèvres? Uh, so Sèvres is, 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 is very sadly unfortunate, and as in the, it is punitive anyway, but beyond that it is uh, very unfortunate because of the mixing of, of uh, punitive aspects, of, uh, of a belated rewarding of World War victors that could not be, re be rewarded in Europe, and then nevertheless progressive elements, uh, so uh, uh, elements uh, that uh, uh, at the end uh, refer to the, uh, to the, to the, to, to the inside that Anatolia is plural. At least it was more plural before the genocides of the First World War, but still was plural and one could restore even plurality. The question was in which terms exactly. That was a, a one big problem, of course. But still, uh, one other important point that related to this, as a, or points, were the return that one that one really uh, supports the return of survivors. That one looks uh, at the uh, at the reparation, the restitution of of possessions and the prosecution 
of volcanoes. That's such a huge aspect. So the the whole tradition of never being of never have to be responsible for for crimes. You are of course absolutely right to point also to European colonial history and and these crimes uh, and and to say. Uh, let's say nearly cynically, and you can do that better as 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 as, as living in Britain than me in, in in Switzerland. But of course, I completely uh, I completely uh, share this vision. And if I had said loss of soul, this is in relative terms. When you directly promise within a few years uh, the protection, salvation, protection, and the future to small peoples, and then you explicitly open to the whole world, you do not, you don't do that. It's a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, a more heavy loss of of rest of claim to morality, to put it in these terms, than when you in a way can a little bit gloss over on the colonial frontiers where you have uh, uh, very, very bad crimes um, uh, that you are responsible for it. Uh, so these are relative terms. I, I would say Britain is more bluntly than ever confronted with its lack of ethics in, in imperial politics. Anyway, it's the total end. That's that's absolutely basic for me. It's the end of empire. Then, <laughs> empire metaphysically is dead at that moment. So the question is, as a metaphysical meaning, there is no no foundation possible in any political philosophy to continue empire. Uh, of course, in pragmatics, yes, perhaps one must, of course, perhaps continue this or that. But in rethinking polity, in rethinking the living together of people, empire cannot be continued. Okay, you can say that's easy to say for a Swiss who lives in an empty imperial entity for 700 years and this very, very consciously. Uh, so this was always an anti-imperial, anti-king, anti-etc. aristocracy feeling, if, even if there were some regional aristocrats for certain times, because of course the influences and, and of course also the nature of the of political men. They, they, but so I, I would very clearly repeat, in empire as a, as a political concept for living together in the future that anyway the socialists understood that even the Bolsheviks claimed that and even if they then turned to empire for me 1920 they turned to empire, empire together with letting down Armenia they, they they very early lost their soul in other words if if you permit to to me to use this uh, expression again. So the best Sevres would certainly have been to, also to, to fully push these, what I call the progressive elements that uh, uh, emphasizing the plural Anatolia uh, with the elements I, men I mentioned. And of course, because no other is, no other plural future is possible in the long term on democratic terms, democratic federal terms. You see in the Middle East, you always come back. Now, the Kurds are those who, who stress the most these after very painful experience of generations. And they are so right. Armenia is the by far most democratic, small, very and threatened country in the more in the north. So you necessarily come back, I would state, to the question of democracy. And I feel it, of course, not like uh, Carl Schmitt. I do not feel the term like Carl Schmitt, which also say, says, yeah, modern mass democracy, that must be authoritarian, that must purify itself, must made, be made homogeneous. Turkey, for him, was a democracy. Imagine that in his Vorrede, so uh, die geistgeschichtliche Lage der, des Parlamentarismus 1926. Turkey, a democracy, a mass democracy, successfully cleansed itself from the foreign elements. That's 
nothing is far away from democracy than this. Democracy in the core is the recognition and acceptance of the existence of the other. So it's the yes to alterity. So there is a there is a there is a limit to oneself. And one has to accept there is alterity. So one has to deal with it. So it's negotiation. It's a social contract, uh, but the democratic social contract. So that's the terms. I, I come always back that there in my mind when I, when I wrote the word democracy, I, I, I nevertheless explain it a bit more at the end in the epilogue. I, I should do it a bit more probably also at, at another place. But uh, democracy, look at socialism, look at this and that, fascism, uh, Turkism, these are all dead notions, in, uh, even if they, unfortunately, as a, I do not say for socialism now, because there is a universal core. So I would a little bit uh, make, distinguish it from the other ideologies of the time, but I would, must, uh, I would have to say Bolshevism. These are dead ideologies, uh, but democracy, interestingly, is still a positive notion, not just for the sound of the word, but because you must and can feel it in a very positive way. And I would repeat, it is the recognition of the other also against the majorities. Democracy has uh, uh, basics that can work uh, uh, that can uh, work uh, effectively in the praxis against majorities. That's very, very important. I'm not sure if I, uh, let's say, did I answer more or less uh, to uh, yes. let's say, first answers Thank more you or very less. Much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now we would uh, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, uh, commentary and uh, also for answering Professor Bloxham's uh, questions. Uh, so now we would like to go to our discussion phase. And uh, so we have uh, uh, we have a, a question from, I think Professor Winter wants to ask a question. So I would like to go to Professor G. Winter. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, once again, I want to uh, reiterate my profound admiration of the book and, and of the author. Uh, it is a major achievement and a major work of scholarship in multiple languages that I think uh, is the gold standard, really, of what we need to do in, in instructing our students in the future. I want to uh, go back to Carl Schmidt because it seems to me that there's an explanation for the failure of democracy that doesn't require Lausanne at all. And it is what Carl Schmidt called the state of exception. Uh, that is what happened in the First World War, and that's what happens in every single imperial project that I know of, that the sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. What happened in the period of the First World War and after is an, a global state of exception. You might even add the Bolshevik Revolution to that. Lenin decided on what is the state of exception. So the legal system becomes subject uh, to the necessity of defending the, uh, the order, the political order. And the fact that Schmidt wrote this in 1922 in political theology, I think is no accident, just at the time of Lausanne. Uh, so my claim is that uh, perhaps extending what Donald Bloxham was saying is that democ democracy didn't die because of Lausanne, but because of a set of uh, political uh, configurations uh, that were uh, disastrous for democratic institutions. And one of them uh, was the state of exception, you know, considering Egypt is a very good example, the British hand over power. And then what, are the, what does the government do? Establish a state of exception. It's what the imperial order uh, had done. And it's what those countries in, uh, in the, shall we say, in the penumbra of the imperial order uh, uh, have done. It's what the, uh, the Soviet Union, still not created in 1921, but in 22, is there. So isn't it possible following, I suppose, Mark Mazower, that uh, democracy was, uh, was dying before Lausanne. And Lausanne didn't do it any good. It was, I think you're right. Uh, it was a, a choice of peace over justice and a denial uh, of the commitments that the imperial powers themselves had made to recognize the just cause of the, of the Armenians and the Kurds. But, but Schmidt had, a, had an insight 
into something about the period of the First World War and its aftermath, which strikes me as part of the story of the failure of democracy that may be necessary to add to the story of Lausanne. Would you agree that this is, this is a, shall we say, an additional dimension of the, of the problem that uh, speaks to the moral and political uh, conclusions that you know, I share with you, uh, but wonder if there really wasn't any chance for democracy at the time. Uh, and we should recognize war itself in the aftermath of war, the bloody sequel to war in the years 1918 to 23 is turning the, the conditions of political life towards the dictatorships. It isn't only uh, Mussolini or, uh, or Ataturk uh, who do it. Uh, it, it is a, a much deeper and, and wider uh, a crisis of democracy uh, uh, that, uh, that we're talking about. So is, it, is Schmidt right? The conditions for democracy in the early 1920s were very, very poor. Yeah, uh, so I thank you for, for, for your uh, comment and, and, and I can share this comment. Uh, uh, it's absolutely not to say that it was only Lausanne then. So Lausanne is in a way the, the final execution, if you want, the most explicit. It is so explicit, Lausanne. Lausanne is so explicit the embrace of social Darwinism. And it is not uh, per accident that Carl Schmitt did not did in his second edition, in the new preface to the second edition, so explicitly refer to the Turkish model. So mm -hmm. things seem to be in a way more open still, even if very bad for democracy in 1922. But mm -hmm. after the treaty, it was so clear for such an intelligent man, one may say, like Carl Schmitt, to say it's now it's it's clear and explicit democracy if there is democracy modern mass democracy must be on the base of a cleansed homogeneous uh, uh, body so lausanne is for schmidt also a cisura in other words but it, what you say uh, jay i i can only agree and and, and also refer to eli halevi this uh, French uh, intellectual Jew who emphasized the state of, uh, sorry, state of exception uh, during World War in almost all states, including in Switzerland, by the way. Uh, but some states could more quickly uh, uh, critically look back and, 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 and put back democratic mechanisms in contrast to others who embraced them even even more so and and lausanne was such an explicit embrace of a, of dictatorship even of course the kemalists they could establish themselves only thanks to lausanne but there was the whole unionist dictatorship behind them so uh, i would say uh, yes, you're right, but Lausanne still marks, uh, let's say, uh, an important season. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kaiser, we have a question from the audience, and the question is by Federico Alistair D'Alessio. So, the question is during the Lausanne negotiations, what were the main factors that led the Allies to drop their demands on Kurdish autonomy and self-determination? This is one question. And the second question is, what is the, this is also by Federico. The question is, what is the role of the Treaty of Lausanne in the current hostilities between Turkey and Greece? And what are the chances of a new conflict over territorial disputes in the region? Yes, also I can relatively shortly answer to the first question. Uh, whereas uh, the, the uh, Armenian home, even in a very reduced uh, uh, version, was still a topic, as I said, Kurdish autonomy was no, in no ways and more, uh, more any, any topic. And uh, the, this had also to do with as not this had of course to do with the military victory of 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 the of the of the Turkish nationalists in the whole of 
Asia Minor, but this victory was part, partly won in an alliance with Kurdish, Sunni Kurdish chiefs. So the Kurds themselves had rallied to uh, Ankara, especially because of their fears of Armenian return, Armenian claims, Armenian regional uh, autonomy or sovereignty. And so there was no reason for the allies to, to, to go back to, to this uh, uh, point of the Severa Treaty, which anyways had depended on a referendum. Uh, if it, it was not uh, stated as such, as in the Armenian case, but it was in the case of a positive referendum that Kurds could be uh, autonomous, even form a state, and even include then also, as opposed to uh, uh, Eastern Anatolia and uh, Northern uh, Iraq. So, so that was in the Severa Treaty, this kind of a, of a, of a bigger Kurdistan was uh, mentioned as a, as, a, as a possibility, but that was absolutely uh, out of question and not touched upon uh, during the negotiations. And then the other question, uh, the other question, sorry, sorry, must, uh, the other question was... Yeah, uh, so the other question is, uh, let me read it once again. So the other question is, what is the role of the Treaty of Lausanne? in the current hostilities between Turkey and Greece, uh, and what yes. are the chances of a new conflict over territorial disputes in the region? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's of course, again, a good question. And uh, uh, as I said, never there had been the, a questioning of the Lausanne Treaty on, on such a high level as we experience it since uh, 10 years, let's say, but especially since four, five years uh, from Ankara. Uh, and uh, the question of border lines now in the sea are, uh, are, are uh, very topical and they need negotiations in order to prevent uh, military confrontation. Uh, and uh, so that's that's a challenge, a diplomatic challenge now, because of course of the com commodities of gas and oil uh, in, in, in the Mediterranean. And uh, we will, uh, uh, we, as that's, yeah, that's something that, that is not solved and that will come back, uh, that will come back. Uh, yeah this conflict uh, in the, if it is not solved uh, uh, between the partners and, and with the supervision of the EU or, 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 the, or the United States. So Lausanne in that sense, because uh, it was only after Lausanne that, that the borders uh, in the, on the sea ground and in the air were more clearly defined. So Laus that, so uh, yeah, that, that was 1923. That was not uh, the technical, uh, etc. possibilities were not so much developed at that time, and one did not know about these resources there. Yeah. Was that, uh, was there another question I did not answer? Uh, no, no. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kaiser, I had a question for you. So, as we know that uh, uh, you mentioned in your book that Lusan opened up a new era of post uh, Ottoman international relations. And uh, even today, like President Erdogan and many significant numbers of Turks believe that Lusan wasn't fair. And there are many conspiracy theories believed as well in Turkey today. So like my question to you is like when this at the eve, when today uh, this treaty would be uh, commemorating a hundredth anniversary and uh, we, we are all aware of Erdogan's massive election victory. How do you see roads for Turkey in the upcoming days? So what is your take on that? Yeah. Uh, just this, the last sentence. I, I did not fully understand the last sentence. Uh, it's a question of, of hearing it. How do Can you, you say see roads for, the tur for Turkey in the upcoming days? Uh, so what will come to Turkey now with, with the centennial of Lausanne? Uh, the, the word 
things will continue as 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 usual so nothing will change uh, but uh, erdogan uh, may uh, it depends a little bit uh, he, he is very uh, dependent now on the huge problems of economy so where he needs the western goodwill so he cannot too much push on the revisionist uh, uh, statements uh, that he made and that were understood by so many Middle Easterners as the end of the Lausanne Treaty in 2023. So I, 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 I believe that there will be a soft passage to the 20, uh, to, to, the, to the 101st anniversary of the Lodan Treaty and not a kind of a, of a break after the 24th of July because of this uh, high dependency now of, of Turkey and especially Turkish economy, but also diplomacy. And we have signs that go in this direction to, to come on better terms with uh, the West and with Israel also. But this does not mean, and these persons and uh, already Ottoman uh, diplomacy and Turkish diplomacy has a long memory. So this can pop up again. So the revisionism is not finished off, off at all. So my answer is a short term answer. But uh, saying some, some things on the long term in the Middle East is very difficult and not a historian's business. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so we do not have any questions in the chat box. So we can uh, we can end our session with this last question, maybe. Uh, so this question is uh, like, uh, and to conclude, I just wanted to ask it uh, to both uh, Professor Kaiser and Loxham that as we know, what lessons should we take from Lusan in this world of emerging tyrants? Like today, not only Turkey's uh, Erdogan, we can also see Putin's Russia and uh, how uh, his uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes has entirely shattered the peaceful world order. So uh, do you find any uh, similarities with this uh, thing and uh, as historians, how can uh, what what you suggest, like how can the model of democratic social contracts be achieved? Yeah. Uh, first, Donald, perhaps uh, didn't you address it to? Or do you address it to me alone? Both, 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 Professor. Both. Yeah. So okay, yes, yeah, no issue. Uh, so well, I, I mean, I it's right. Please, I mean, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like an incredibly important question. I, I don't. I wish. I think there's nothing that I can say that would be anything other than trite because I just don't really have. I mean, I can give you a wish list of things, but but in terms of actually securing the possibilities, on the ground in in so many places, well. I mean, I don't, you know, I, <laughs> this is a very, I, I think I have nothing profound to say, you know, I really wish I had something profound to say. Um, Hans Lucas, might you say some things? Um, because this would be better, I think, than me, because I, I really would like to have a good answer to this question, but I, I think that I, look, okay, so insofar as I think I can diagnose what's gone wrong in lots of places, I suppose then the absence of those factors would, would be a good way of things not going wrong. That's not necessarily to say they wouldn't have gone wrong in a different way. Um, the, the presence of external actors is always a very peculiar and, 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 and difficult and vexed one. I mean, the, the late Ottoman Empire is a prime example of a situation where you've got, you know, not saying that external actors have more blame than internal actors or vice versa, but the interaction between them. I mean, when we talk about democracy, we tend to talk about something that happens within a particular space, right? I mean, there's no such thing as global democracy. 
right? As in, with the globe as a whole, I mean, we got some sort of simulacra of that, but the United Nations isn't it. I think United Nations is a very good thing, but isn't it? You know, on the whole, we've talked about democracy historically, and now we mean democracy within certain states. External states may themselves be democracies, but when they intervene in the actions of, of other states, they don't necessarily act as democracies. I'm not quite sure what, if there's such a thing as a democratic foreign policy, I'm not sure what that would look like. It's just, um, in so many of the situations we're talking about now, let's say the Middle East or elsewhere, um, uh, we've, we've situations where some of the crises of modernity and modernization have only been thrown up by the reaction between actors within a state and actors external to that state. And so many of the actions of the internal actions of the actors within the state have been conceived in relationship to an outside world that they consider potentially hostile. The Ottoman Empire is par excellence the example of, a, of an entity that was relatively weak compared to relatively stronger players and the relatively stronger players had a relatively large influence on its course. Then in the fragmentation of the Ottoman Empire, as we've heard from this book, the old core of the Ottoman Empire, Anatolia, um, hacks its way out of the old empire itself and becomes incredibly sovereign within its core, but with a hyper kind of sort of paranoiac aggression towards external actors and anyone internal who is conceived to be in league with the external actors. The whole of the rest of the Middle East is a, is a story of polities that from their very inception have been the creation and partly the playthings of external actors. Right, and there's there's something about when we're talking about the conditions for democracy. This is my own, this isn't a full answer at all, but it's just one thing that I've, I've been thinking about at the moment. There's a difficulty between trying to establish the conditions for a democracy amongst actors who are party to that democracy, than actors who are external, whose major interests may coincide with the internal actors, but but only contingently, because the major impact and interests of outside players tend to be what they project their own national interests, their own internal potentially democratic interests may not coincide with the democratic interests of, of actors on the ground. So even if we have kind of democratic outsiders involving themselves in the actions of would-be Democrats in other states, there's not necessarily a real coincidence of democratic interests. Right? So if we're talking about, so, yeah, I mean, we, 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 what we really, in some sense, deal with is, 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 you know, a continuation in the Middle East, or a continuation of the Eastern question, how to deal with the breakdown of the Ottoman Empire by a group of external powers that are still interested in that. The names of the powers and the identities of the powers have shifted and the power relations have shifted. But when it comes to kind of arbitrating the conditions for democracy, um, the people on the ground are not alone in this and establishing the particular nature of their relations without external players. Um, and, oh, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. Hans Lucas, please take over. Sorry. Sorry, Sumavo. This is, I have nothing sensible to say. I know that these are, of course, uh, good thoughts, um, uh, Donald. Uh, I would, however, uh, uh, be uh, positive, uh, at least for the direction, as, as I said it already. Uh, the direction can only be toward democracy if we want peace in the long term and not war. And this is for Israel, Palestine, this is for Iraq, this is for Turkey, this is for Syria. So certain things are simple, uh, even if they are very complicated if we, if we start to, to think them in international relation uh, terminology. Uh, of course, the democratic forces should be supported wherever possible. Why to leave, for example, the, 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 the Kurds in northern Syria so alone, even with their European prisoners? It's simply shameful. Why to give them the Leopard tanks to occupy Afrin? Uh, saying, yeah, we had a contract for 15 years earlier, etc. So we have still to, to deliver munition to, to Hong Kong. So there are a lot of things that can now be done better. That's absolutely clear. Uh, and of course, there is also Northern Iraq, where very fragile democracy now, always postponement of the elections. That's not good. But 
it's not lost now that the chaos is not lost one has one has to push and and realistically every uh, polity needs the of course the inside uh, insiders uh, the, the, the the forces inside but also those outside I can again speak speak as a, as a Swiss Swiss democracy grew always also in the interaction with constructive outside forces beat Britain beat France beat another one so it's 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 a, it's a question of how when and to know the goal, where to go. And what has happened since Lausanne, now for a century, was sometimes so shameful international relation, so shameful denialism. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, no, no, I do not say sorry. I very much appreciate that, that Donald said, said, I have uh, also a kind of a, of a moral perspective in the book. But that's not for the morality itself. That's because I believe that polities are stronger and 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 live better. Everybody wants to live, have a good life. Uh, uh, if they are able to 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 bring morality in to a certain extent, that uh, that's uh, at least the basics of 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 the morality, which I tried to explain before. Yeah, so let's let it be as it stand with these words. Thank you so much, Professor Kaiser, for the ex excellent answer, and also to Professor Bloxham. So it was wonderful to have this session today, and we are we have to conclude the session now. So it was a so for our audiences, I would like to mention that uh, Professor Kaiser's book is a very interesting and a stimulating research. So please do buy it and read, and it would be an interesting read for this uh, 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 this uh, anniversary of Lausanne, uh, which is going to occur next month on 24th July. Uh, so it, it, it's going to be a very uh, impactful read, and I'm sure everyone would like Professor Kaiser's work. So with this, uh, thank you so much to Professor Kaiser, Professor Bloxham, and also Professor Winter for uh, joining us and being present in the panel today. So with this, we end our session. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you.